as one of the most prominent figures of the Gezi Park movement, namely the Standing Man. Simply standing in the middle of Taksim Square, facing the Atatürk Cultural Center, not moving, not shouting, not doing anything but standing there for hours. At first, his presence went unnoticed. But after some time, more and more people got not only interested, but joined Bündis until the police banished them from the square and arrested some people. The Standing Man was an art performance as well as a political act, criticizing the prohibition of demonstrations, demonstrating without actually demonstrating in a classical way. The Standing Man refuses to move, doesn't behave like he or she is total, he she is not a passenger, passing the street rather, he she stands still and therefore blocks traffic and disturbs public policy. The activists who were squatting public squares did something very similar. In building tents and actually living on the square, they don't follow the rules set up by the government, they don't behave like they are told to. They also refused movement, stood still and occupied. Since the beginning was the standing man more than an art performance. It was a simple but effective way of protesting against the law which prohibits the very act of protesting. So it is of course no coincidence that the standing man became an important protest strategy, not only in Turkey. The standing man is anonymous, also it was started by an artist. Um, therefore everyone can become a standing man, can adapt the strategy and use it. It became, one can say, a meme, not only on social media, where photos of standing man performance brought at least traces of immobility on the ever moving social media walls and feeds, but furthermore, the standing man also became a meme on the street, being Im imitated, repeated, and culturally adapted, for instance, as graffiti or as uh, in many other forms. Somehow, this silent standing creature became omnipresent and revealed more about the protest and the repression against protest than many other pictures, slogans, and essays could. The Gezi movement, it seems, or at least was at least for a brief moment the loudest and the most moving when it was reduced to silently standing people. Instead of joining the logic of whoever shouts the loudest and jumps the highest gets hurt, the standing man stands literally out exactly by refusing to shout, even refusing to speak at all and by refusing to move even when the police wants him or her to move. Um, in the famous uh, play by Büchner, uh, Tantan's death, Robespierre uh, says to, shouts uh, to Tantan um, uh, before he arrests him, um, he says, anybody who stands still in a forward moving crowd is just as big a hindrance as uh, if he moved against the crowd. So, yeah. In his text on Bartleby, Deleuze emphasizes that the strength of Bartleby's famous phrase, I would prefer not to, is the lack of any aim. The phrase is no absolute refusal, nor does it refer to any preferred alternative. It is exactly this indiscernibility that Lewis finds so powerful. A quote from the Bartleby text, The formula is devastating because it eliminates the preferable just as merciless as any non-preferred. It holds out an ever-expanding zone of indiscernibility or indetermination. Quote the standing man is anything but passive. On the contrary, he or she also creates these zones of indiscernibility, standing there, not saying why, formulating no demands, but at the same time not following the order of the police. The standing man does not prefer to move and behave normal. Without anything, the standing man does not even have, uh, without saying anything, the standing man does not even have a formula. Sharing a similar immobility as many characters in Beckett's work, the standing man also creates the territory, changing the space around him. In uh, the Thousand of the Toast, the Lucy Battery say in the quote, in their trash can or on their bench, Beckett's characters stake out the territory. Like a standing wave or a wheel turning so fast that it looks like it would not turn at all, the standing man is characterized by intensity and not by movement. The standing man is therefore what Deleuze and Gattari would call a nomad. And I quote again a thousand plateaus. The nomad distributes himself in a smooth space. He occupies, inhabits, holds that space. That is his territorial principle. It is therefore false to define the nomad by movement. 
Thornaby is profoundly right to suggest that the nomad, that the nomad is on the contrary, he who does not move. But social movements are manifold and do not only have one sort of figure. A very differ, different and nevertheless somewhat similar figure, which emerged also from the Gezi movement, is the whirling dervish with a gas mask. Combining the traditional religious as well as artistic practice of the whirling dervish with one of the tragic and at the same time iconic motives of the Gezi movement, namely the gas mask, an essential tool for the protesters against the disproportionate usage of tear gas and other chemicals. So this gas mask was uh, used uh, in, in sort of graffitis, uh, maybe you know the penguins with the gas mask on, so it was uh, reiterated uh, through the whole movement. The whirling dervish does not lack movement, but nonetheless is he, I would suppose, uh, propose also defined by intensity. His her movement has no aim. He, she is not moving forward, not dancing in a specific direction, but on the contrary, his and her movement remains on the point. In this sense, the whirling dervish is also a nomad, because it takes out the territory, not caring where everyone around him goes, but simply remaining on the spot, dancing not for the amusement of other people. Rotating ghostly like around him and herself, the whirling dervish seems outer world. Dancing in the middle of the protesting crowd or an occupied square, the whirling dervish follows a different logic, a different formula than all the other protesters. In contrast to the standing man, the whirling dervish draws on a traditional cultural technique one has to learn and practice. It is therefore not something everyone can join or imitate, as with the standing man. Nonetheless, it is also an anonymous figure. The gas mask is not only a symbol of the Gizzi movement, but it is also a mask making the world dervish a figure instead of a specific human being. By combining traditional elements with the gas mask, the world dervish is a hybrid and creates already in its very appearance a zone of indiscernibility. It does not matter who is standing in the way of the police and it does not matter who is whirling under the mask. Both figures refuse typical movement, difficult and normal, human behavior and human movement and increase instead the intensity as well as the zones of indiscernibility. The whirling dervish does not speak, he she also does not formulate specific demands, it is his lack of demanding which characterizes these two figures and which makes it so hard for repressive forces to deal with them. How can you arrest someone when he or she is not doing anything, just standing? Um, or even when he she is only dancing a traditional dance, of course, they found uh, this not very interesting. There is a third figure, beside the standing man and the dancing dervish that I want to describe here, but unlike the others, the figure is a spe special work of one artist, and it is also very much um, not uh, imitated. Um, namely, the Russian performance artist Piotr Robensky. His performances are in many different ways very interesting, but I want to focus on his more recent political performance. On the 10th of November 2013, the official day of police in Russia, Pablensky went to the Red Square, got naked, sat down and nailed his scrotum on the stone floor. Pablensky called this performance fixation. And as you can see, it is another form of immobility, chosen but at the same time painful. His act of art and resistance was inspired by stories he got told from a fellow inmate when Poblensky was in prison for one of his earlier performances. The inmate, inmate told him that in the gulags, prisoners nailed the sprotons on a tree to protest against the inhumane conditions. The story Poblensky told in an interview stuck uh, in his head. As the police arrived, they ordered him to stand up until they realized that following the order would, even if he want, wanted to follow it, not be that easy. Fixation was the follow-up performance of Karkas. Another violent and hard-to-watch performance. In May 2013, Pobetsky wrapped himself naked into barbed wire in protest against the Russian repression against artists, especially against the Pussy Riot and the opposition. Pobetsky performances are also about resisting orders and refusing movement. 
In an interview with The Guardian, he said, and I quote here, Whenever I do a performance like this, I never leave the place. It's important for me that I stay there. The authorities are in a dead-end situation and don't know what to do. They can't ask the person to leave a square because he's nailed to the square. And they can't do anything with a man inside a bar prior. Although Kavlensky's performance is a part of his ongoing critique and struggle with the Russian government, most of the actual performances lack typical signs of protest. There are no banners with paroles, he's not shouting anything, instead there is a strange and, if you watch the video, videos, a nightmarish silence surrounding his mutilated body. Not even the police is talking much. But Polensky made his refusal to speak, even to the subject of one of his performances, namely his performance from 2012, Stitch, where he sewed his lips together. Oblensky's performances had a complete different perspective to the group of figures I gathered in this paper. Beside the immobile, immobile body and the dancing body, there is the violated body. Oblensky shows the vulnerability of the body and the harsh daily violence people experience when they resist, but also the hopelessness and violence they feel when they do not resist, stuck in the repressive barbed wire cages. But there is another aspect Oblensky's work adds to the other figures. Pavlensky actually did a new performance uh, two days ago, so I had just some paper, um, just in the night between Sunday and Monday, where he set fire at the entrance uh, of FSP Security Service. It's a building where the former KGB uh, was and where many people got tortured and um, yeah, nobody knows what they are doing now. Um, he was arrested and may face criminal charges for arson, which could lead up to five years of prison. Yeah. In his performance, he is still uh, captured. In his performance, Pavlensky reenacts scenes uh, we all know from streets riot, street riots, as happened in London or the US of Paris. Riots are maybe the sort of movement which is most often accused of being without aim purely destructive, without any political demand. What Poplensky does with his performance is to translate the language of riots into a work of art. And he does this by rioting, of course, um, historical in form and very aimed because he chooses this building, but nonetheless he... Uh, yeah. right. In current social movements, all of these three figures are present at the same time. The immobility when spotting a house or a public square, the cannibalesque dancing, the euphoria of building a movement, and unfortunately, too often also, the harsh repression against the activists. What all these mentioned art artistic practices have in common is that they resist communication. That is, in some sense, a similarity to current movements. It is one of the most common accusations, not only against uh, riots, but against uh, social movements as the Indignados occupy the Gezi movement, that they do not articulate clear demands, say what they want and why they are protesting. Increased by the non-representative structure, relying on fundamental equality and direct democracy, current social movements do not speak with one voice. Politicians as well as the media often criticize this lack of communication. But what does communication mean? Cardinalist communication is, in the quote again from the lecture, the transmission and propagation of information. And information is, to quote again, a set of imperatives, slogans, and direction order words, as he states uh, in this lecture. So for Deleuze, communication has to do with borders, with being told what to say, to think, and how to behave. And information is the system of control, he also connects this with his uh, control uh, society um, essay. Outside these orders of communication, there is no communication, as Deleuze says, meaning that the hegemonic system can only understand what it can classify as communication. The artistic figures, as well as most of the um, current social movements, do not speak as one has to speak. Therefore, it seems that they do not communicate. But that does not mean that they do not speak at all. On the contrary, the movements, as well as these artistic performances, speak with many different voices on manifold levels. Art and resistance to speak a different kind of language they create this different kind of language. The lecture from 1987 I cited again and again in this paper is called What is a Creative Act? 
And the answer is, of course, that a creative act is something different than communication. It is something new, something which cannot be understood in the language of the order. As De Lewis emphasizes in his lecture, and I quote him again, what relationship is there between the work of art and communication? None at all. A work of art is not an instrument of communication. A work of art has nothing to do with communication. A work of art does not contain the least bit of information. In contrast, there is a fundamental affinity between a work of art and an act of resistance to that. And one can also, of course, uh, think on, on the passages of the Control Society essay, uh, of the interview with, uh, with Negri, where he also says that we got to hijack speech, we have to stop uh, communicating because uh, communication is already corrupted in capital. Um, and that we have to create uh, what he says, records of non-communication. So I come to my conclusion. The here proposed figures for works of art as well as acts and strategies of resistance. All of them start, start processes of fabulation. Fabulating, in an open, fabulating is an open process of creation, process of becoming. Uh, I quote, uh, it is the task of the fabulating function to invent the people, as the says. This invention is not a conscious one, not a scheduled one, and it cannot be planned. In contrast to the racist hordes marching in more and more European cities, chanting, uh, at least in German, they say, we isn't this fault, so it translates to we are the people, we the people, and we are the particular uh, national people, and uh, they chanting this while they burning down uh, houses for refugees. The here proposed figures are not able to name their people, not even to address them. But we do not have, nor do we want such a people, such an ignorant belief and even the slightest possibility of a thing like pure people. The people to come are busted people, as the Lewis says, always incomplete and always manifold. Standing, dancing, burning or bleeding, these are many different ways in calling to people to come, but communication is not one of them. Resistance has to cut up, to use, uh, to use uh, Boros' uh, technique, which also uh, to lose, uh, yeah, uh, points to when he talks about uh, ways of, of avoiding communication. We have to cut up communication, the order, language, and create new ways of speaking. But this will not be a proper and poetic language, but a minor one, a stuttering one. Breaking the patterns of hegemonic communication, the proposed figures stand, dance, and bleed in uncanny silence. But as with John Cage's piece uh, for 33, uh, um, to not make music, to not speak, um, does not mean that there is total silence but, silence, but means, on the contrary, that one can hear new things, things which normally are unnoticed. So if you think of a famous recording, uh, a BBC orchestra, you hear people coughing, you hear the venue and, and all the, the chairs and stuff that you normally don't hear because it is a lot. Breaking communication means to make noise, the double meaning, namely disturbing sounds as well as dysfunction or error. The gathered figures refuse to move, refuse to communi communicate and therefore create territories and zones of indiscernibility in which these noises, these errors can be heard, in which the stuttering manifold of human and non-human bodily and object related voices can be heard, in which the problems and political points in a rioting mass can be heard. And I quote again uh, Deleuze from uh, the uh, Critical and Clinical. When a language is so strained that it starts to stutter or to murmur or stammer, the language in its entirety reaches the limit that marks its outside and makes it confront silence. The here proposed figures in refusing to move and communicate in the, request, in the requested normal way are stuttering this unbearable loud silence in which traces of new voices, problems and demands Thank you very much for the discussion we had.
from Jan Lukan, this could be a good appendix to this discussion to show you that. My question is, I mean, I think what Dr. Marina Brown is kind of thing, is it really necessary that the, the only way seems to be that we think pay to ourselves, or that there's another show that we live in impossible places, like that guy in Berlin? Is this, is this the only way for us all these of ours? I don't think that it's the only way. Um, the standing men or the the whirling dervish are, are more joyful, maybe, especially the dervish it can be um, a good, um, maybe a good way to, to um, make this point. But um, yeah, it's it's um, I, I I I would refuse the the, the norm only way because I think that uh, um, the protest and art has always many ways and I just uh, showed three different and there are many many more but the, the, the point I wanted to make is also uh, to, to the discussion before is that uh, of course art uh, can be political and uh, as Stilo says has to be political or is political when it is considered a great effect you know? um, but it's also as, as was discussed it cannot be by one person only, even if uh, Oblensky stands there alone, uh, but it refers always to a collective, it refers to the, to the collective, to the minorities, to the collectives, which are already resisting, re resisting all the time. We have uh, social movements um, in, in every instance, but um, we don't hear all of them, we don't hear about social movements in Africa here. So it's, it's what, what some of these movements or what art can do is to build territories and create territories where we can actually hear what's going on. It's, it's also not to speak, does not mean not to have demands or not to, to make a point, uh, but it means that uh, one do not have to follow the logic uh, which is implied how to speak um, and which, uh, which is that most of the demands cannot be heard. I, um, I think that in, in every riot in, in the banlieues in Paris, there are plenty of uh, demands and plenty of problems which are directly pointed to, but uh, uh, of course they are not uh, formulated in the kind of way uh, media or politicians um, can address to with the on sentence uh, answers. Okay. Uh, Christopher, I just wanted to say that uh, I really appreciate your kind of uh, presentation. It, it made uh, some very important insights for me. I think uh, it, its validity lies in the fact that basically what you are doing, as I see it, you are reconfiguring the very notion of social movements, which is kind of, uh, you are arriving at this kind of non-dialectical um, the, the notion of social movement whereby you kind of substitute the word uh, movement uh, with absolute speed which is kind of go, goes back to nomadology kind of Platon and is saying that you know you know that nomads really do not move that it's they don't have movement but kind of absolute speed uh, I think what I could uh, perhaps add to this is that also perhaps it would be worthwhile to explore the notion not only of movement and uh, the like spatial dimension but also this kind of temporal one. Uh, what I mean here for example especially with this kind of uh, case study of uh, wearing a dervish, uh, I think you know, because uh, becoming is also kind of duration. So I think you know the kind of idea of whirling dervish. It's it's uh, it's also kind of it has a spatial dimension, but it also articulates uh, some sort of transversal temporality as a means of resistance. So what I mean here is actually it's creatively deploying the uh, deploying the power of anachronism which is actually the whirling dervish, the kind of anachronic, uh, kind of traditional, kind of cultural, kind of Turki Turkish expression. And it's kind of creating a new kind of past future, if you like, so the notion of kind of 
cone of time, but he uses creatively the past to kind of create a kind of parallel future, which is not future, you know, which is not present future, which, you know, goes uh, with the, you know, Erdogan presiding over this future. So it actually um, combines the kind of spatial movement with this kind of transversal temporality. And also I think it's a similar moment in play with Pavlensky, because um, I did lots of research on, on him because I'm teaching actually about uh, um, political performance art. And actually Pavlensky's kind of um, feedback he got and the analysis from people was that some people said that he really is a kind of really conservative artist in many ways. It's kind of, it's a figure that harks back to like, it's like a dissident figure of Soviet times, uh, of the, you know, uh, I don't know, let's say in 1960s or something like that. So it's also kind of anachronistic in a way and he deploys this kind of, to create a new kind of past future. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On, on, only a short comment. It's, yeah. it's, uh, it's of course uh, he he, he uh, directly uh, uh, shows the continuations of uh, Soviet movement uh, and and, and uh, Putin, uh, so to say, with uh, tackling the KGB building, KGB building, which is still uh, the building for uh, for, the, for the now new security. So thank you, Christoph. It was really, a, really an interesting presentation, I would say. Um, very informative. Uh, I have only something to remark that for me there is a very interesting moment which is going on here that the pictures I saw now from an intercultural perspective are much more not pictures of our cultures where we have always that kind of movement, but really like cultures like Asia, yeah? where you always had the picture of political resistance as you are not eating, so you are hunger struck, yeah. or you stand, you are not moving anymore. So it is maybe surprising for our culture, but in other cultures this is very typical how you resist it to, to the state or to ever. Yeah? And only one remark to a story that this is, I think, few people know this story. The mayor of the city of Delhi, yeah, which has double, double population than whole Austria. Yeah. The mayor was, he was in charge, so he was the official mayor of the city and last year because he could not get a, a law was not passing, there was too much resistance from the old parties and so what he was doing as the mayor in charge, he was sitting in front of the mayor's house and doing nothing, he said he will not move till this law goes through because it's important to stop corruption in India. And he did even as a politician, he used that kind of resistance, what you were showing here by the artist, which I would say is almost typical for a culture like Asian culture where you see in the non language really a big force of persons. So this was only a, a, a remark. And, and yes. And we have a question. Can I, can I just simply ask you that what about like, uh, you know, uh, Occupy movements? They are not moving and they are in the West. I think you are pursuing a very dangerous direction here with essentializing that, saying that, you know, moving is typical for kind of Western art and this quietism or something, it's like in the East. I think it's, I, I, I think I, I don't agree with you. It's, it's kind of a bit some sort of establishing some sort of essentialist pose or something like that. It's to say that, okay, this kind of East, like the Turkey and Russia and this near is some sort of uh, some sort of different mode of operation and it establishes this kind of ontological duality that would be actually a hostile to this kind of thing. I don't know, it's just impression. I think it's a good topic. If you have a quick comment or for the coffee break. Yes, I'm not exactly exactly that it was important for me that this figure was showing up that was exactly
exactly the beginning, not in the Eastern culture, but it was showing up in the Western culture. So it exactly broke up this kind of stereotype. So that was one, one dimension. Thank you so much, Christoph.